Oh boy. I heard you missed me. We're back. I brought my pencil. Give me something to write on, man. If you know who that is, post it in the comments. Mm. Coffee cheers, boys and girls. Boom. 8.56 a.m. in the morning on a lovely Wednesday, September the 6th of the year of our Lord, 2017. What's happening, man? Good to see you. It's been a little while. I've been on a uh, wild ride with a book recently. Mm. And I'm having some coffee, and I thought I'd shoot a video and tell you about it. Why not? I mean, because why not? If you If you don't know... The thing I said in the intro was the beginning to a uh, an old Van Halen video, Hot for Teacher, from the 80s, where the they have little kid versions of everyone on the band. Genius video. And then the teachers whip off their clothes and they start stripping in school, on the dancing on the desks for the kids. Something that would totally not, not fly today. But back then, it blew our little 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old minds. And I have Van Halen on my brain because I just finished reading a book by Sammy Hagar, who was the second singer for Van Halen. After David Lee Roth left in like 1984, Van Halen was the biggest band in the world. He quit and went to do solo stuff to feed his ego or whatever. And Van Halen got a new singer, a guy named Sammy Hagar. That's when I was introduced to Sammy Hagar. I knew that I had known Sammy from a video for I Can't Drive 55 was big on MTV back then. But I, that's all I knew about him. I Can't Drive 55, that's it. They had hired that guy to sing for Van Halen. And my whole life, like I actually went to see Van Halen on that tour with Sammy Hagar. I was too young to really remember it. But I do remember clearly everyone was screaming F Sammy, F Sammy, F Sammy. Like they didn't like Sammy, they wanted Dave. And so we joined in and I saw a, f a shoe on the ground and I have a clear memory. We were at the Myriad in Oklahoma City and for some reason I have a clear memory of picking up this shoe and the stadium wasn't packed. It wasn't sold out. There were a lot of empty seats and it was. I was able to pick up the shoe off the ground that someone had left or dropped or thrown and I was able to throw it at the stage, and I was trying to hit Eddie Van Halen with the shoe. I don't know why. I was probably 13 years old, and you're just being a jerk. But I did throw it. It went whizzed past his head, and he kind of looked at us. And we were like, hey, he looked at us. It's like, yeah, you tried to kill him, man. But anyway, Sammy Hagar was the second, their second singer, and they, they put out hit after hit after hit for a decade, and then they had a really bad breakup. I never really knew what happened, and I was listening to a podcast with him the other day where he was answering some questions, and his answers were really intriguing and cool, and he's such a smart, I had never heard an interview with the guy. I just knew him as the Red Rocker, and he kind of fell off my radar after Van Halen petered out. But um, I, heard I heard him on a podcast, it was like Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone Magazine, Top 10, Sammy Hagar life tips or something and I listened to it and it blew my mind so much that I went and got the book and I read it. It's called Sammy Hagar Read My Uncensored Life or something like that. And the first line of the book blew my mind because it says right around the beginning he says I was born in wherever in 1947. And I had to stop the book right there and just do the math. Like the first, I read one sentence. It was like, wait a minute. Oh my God, he's 70 years old. Like he's 70 years old right now. It's so crazy that that's even possible. Uh, because he was in Van Halen, but it turns out he was about 10 years older than the guys in Van Halen or something. He was much older. And he had a career that spanned back two decades before he joined Van Halen. He was playing music in the 60s, the 70s, and then joined Van Halen in the mid 80s. And I had no idea about any of this stuff or any of the other stuff that he'd done. But it was really an incredible book. It's one of those books I started reading. I haven't listened to a Sammy Hagar tune in decades. I started reading the book and just got sucked in. And I was done in, I think I spent two full days, like reading it off and on for the entire day. It just sucked me in. I'd wake up, read a, read a chapter. In the middle of the day, I'd read a couple more chapters. And then at night, I'd read before I went to bed. And it totally sucked me in because his story reminded me a lot like mine. In the beginning, he was extraordinarily poor. 
and came from really rough upbringings. His dad was a, uh, an alcoholic, severe, and his dad also fancied himself a bit of a boxer. This guy was a badass. He was knocking people out left and right. He was missing teeth. He'd come home. He'd be fighting. He would have fought people. But he was a really bad drunk. And he tells stories about how his dad used to come home after work. He'd come home late, drunk, and beat up his mom. He never abused the kids, but he beat up his mom and attack her and have sex with her while he's beating her and like just all this horrific stuff. And I, that's probably what got me because I had some weird stuff going on in my childhood too. And my dad was also, uh, you know, alcoholic and he abused my mom and I, all that stuff. And that's probably what got me, you know, in the beginning of a movie or the beginning of a book, something has to, I have to have a connection with something to keep going or I'll just lose interest. And now that I'm talking about it, I, I bet that's what it was like, oh, wow, he was just like me. Little poor kid, crazy parents, everything out of control. And it was so bad, and it happened so many times, that he said that when, if, there, if his dad wasn't home by a certain hour, so let's say he gets off at 5, if he wasn't home by 6.30, the family would start making preparations for the disaster that was coming. And his mom would stash blankets and pillows, you know, and water, something to eat. She had it stashed in plastic bags in a, a orange grove that they lived next to. And when their dad came home, sure enough, he'd be drunk. They'd just leave, go sleep in the orange grove, and come back when he was sober. So really traumatic, crazy childhood. But, you know, he, he started playing music, got a guitar, started playing in bands, and was struggling just like anyone else, playing club gigs, making no money, playing for free, trying to, you know, pass around a hat, things like that. Then he ended up, you know, writing a few hits, getting a record deal, had a solo career, joined Montrose, which I never knew anything about Montrose, but he was a singer in Montrose, and Ronnie Montrose was the guitar player. Never knew that any of that history, and they were big. They were, you know, they were a big band playing stadiums and uh, theaters and all that. And then he quit. It was a really bad breakup with Ronnie Montrose. He he let him go. He fired him basically. And Sammy said, "Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do all the stuff that I told you I wanted to do." He got fired because he wanted to put on a bigger show, like really dress it up, pay for the extra money to light off bombs and, you know, have cool stuff on stage. And Ronnie Montrose just fired him because he didn't agree with that. So he went and did it himself and that his career blew up. He became bigger than Montrose. And in his solo career, he was as big as Van Halen was. They were about the same level until Jump hit. And if you were around in the 80s and you remember MTV, when Jump came out, it was the biggest video, the biggest song. Van Halen was just huge and it was those videos that really did it people forget i even forget sometimes how powerful mtv was back in the day if you had two three hit videos you would sell two three million albums just from the videos then you go out and tour went over fans that way and you know but he said when jump hit they leapt up to another stratosphere and he couldn't quite keep up but then david lee roth quit and sammy hagar who was dealing with all kinds of crazy stuff with his wife, uh, got the call. He was thinking about retiring. He had a couple million in the bank, and he was like, I think I could just retire forever, take care of my wife, who was having mental problems and uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. But then Van Halen called, and he joined the band. And I had heard the legends about, you know, when he joined the band, they said that one of their Ferrari mechanic, they, sh they had a mutual Ferrari mechanic, Lamborghini mechanic, Sammy and Eddie Van Halen. And he was the one that suggested to Eddie, he said, hey, do you know Sammy Hagar? And Eddie said, yeah, of course, I love Sammy Hagar. He said, you should call him, ask him to join the band. And so Eddie used the mechanic's phone, dialed Sammy Hagar and said, let's do this. And, you know, a few days later, they got together and jammed and it happened. So they spent the next 10 years pumping out hits. I can remember, my God, when 5150 came out, I was a little kid, but I was old enough to be out of the house on the weekends in Ada. There was nothing to do. So on the weekends, kids, if you had a friend with a car, you just got in your car and you cruised up and down Main Street and you drove in a circle. There were about four streets. You just went down a few blocks, this way a few blocks, this way a few blocks, this way a few blocks. And that's what we did on the weekends. And I remember very specifically hearing Garth Brooks. I got friends in low places. I heard that in a, for playing from someone's truck in one of those parking lots that we used to hang out in. They called it parking. You just parked. And, and drank or smoked pot, got in a fight. And I remember when that album came out with Sammy Hagar, 5150. I think it was 5150. Whatever had like Hot Summer Nights. Summer Nights my radio. 
and those big, big, huge songs. I remember hearing them playing out of people's cars in that parking lot going, wow, this is incredible. This is great, you know, this is great. I remember exactly when it came out. But they took over the world, and then it crumbled because, he, man, he goes deep. And who knows? Remember, we're only uh, getting one side of one person's story, but he goes in pretty deep on the stories about the Van Halen brothers and how effed up they were and drunk. And he was saying things like, allegedly, Alex was such a drunk before he got sober that at one, at one period he was drinking so much that he would just wake up at 4 a.m., down a bottle of vodka, smoke a cigarette, and then just go back to sleep. And then he would wake up hours later to start the day and really start drinking. The, the vodka was just, that was, he drank it in his sleep, like literally in his sleep. And then it would go on and on and on, and he was hurting himself, tore his face up in a driveway one time, and was having trouble, big, big trouble with it. And he got sober. They staged an intervention. But Eddie remained, allegedly, Eddie remained drunk. And I've seen some videos on YouTube, and when you see him, you see Eddie Van Halen drunk, it's terrifying. He drinks like I used to drink. He reminds me of me and of my dad, because it's just, it's not even cool, it's scary. It's like terrifying. You know, his voice is weird. His face is weird and skinny and crazy looking. But the stories that Sammy goes into about those guys... And if you remember, there's YouTube videos. If you watch on YouTube, look for Van Halen 2004, Eddie Van Halen eruption. And you can see the state that Eddie was in. I missed all this because I had started listening to Nirvana, Jane's Addiction, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, all that. And we all kind of, I didn't listen to Van Halen anymore, so I lost, I lost touch with him. Then to go back and see those videos of Eddie in 2004, just so drunk that he can't stand. He was like sitting on the drum riser, trying to play his guitar, and he couldn't. You know, here's the best, probably one of the top two or three guitar players ever in the history of music, and he couldn't play the guitar. Very strange to see and sad. But they ended up, they broke up. There's so many details in the book, it's amazing. But my main takeaway from the book is that in a lot of ways, I got, I got, we get things wrong. You see someone who's made it, whether it's music or whatever, and you think this is some sort of a lucky guy. Oh, he's just probably comes from a place of privilege. You know, he probably got a big loan like Trump to start his empire. You know, maybe his dad was a businessman. But what you don't realize is that that's not the case. Like those huge rock stars that I used to watch on TV and idolize, they were just guys like me that picked up guitars and, and worked <laughs> constantly and hard. And that's one of the big takeaways I took was the amount of work that all of the people that he talked about in the book did like the Van Halen brothers they played music every single day all day in the garage where they'd built the 5150 studio just all day every day practicing recording writing riffs putting them down you know they had a hundred uh, song ideas there's a thousand song ideas somewhere on uh, hard drives I, I would I would bet you that never got released but the amount of hard work that was involved was the thing that slipped my mind in the beginning I, I swear to God there was a point where I thought Okay, I can admit this on YouTube, I guess. I've said a lot of crazy stuff on here. But there's a thing I used to do <laughs> when I was a, probably a preteen into early teens in Ada, Oklahoma, which at the time was a town of about 4,000 people or something. I, f I had it in my mind that at some point in my life, a limousine was going to pull up with a briefcase full of money, and they were going to say, hey, kid, we heard you got the goods. We want to give you a million dollars. We're going to put you in a private jet and fly you back to L.A., and we're going to record an album. That's how I thought people were discovered. I had no clue. I was, you know, maybe I read it in a book or something. But um, I always thought I would go out for walks. I'd be in, at home, nothing to do, like, man, what am I going to do? Well, I'll go walk around in case that limousine's driving around Ada, Oklahoma right now. And I would. I would go walk for half an hour around the neighborhoods, around the grocery store. And in my head, I would, I would be realistically thinking like, 
Man, when they pull up, when they find me, this is going to be amazing. I had no, <laughs> no idea that you still had to do the work. No matter what it is, you have to do the work, man. Whether you want to be a baseball player, a UFC fighter, a boxer, a rock star, whatever, the work, the people who win are the people who work. And it's not even the people who are the most talented because, I mean, in, in music, we all know bands that aren't very good that make a lot of money. You know, I'm sure a name just popped in your head, posted in the comments. Whoever, I've got one. Uh, a lot, uh, there's a lot of bands that weren't really very, they weren't the greatest musicians, but they made tons of money. Their songs weren't very good, but they make tons of money. I mean, it's going on right now. You can almost predict, like, the bigger the star is, the worse the music is. Because in order to become a star, you have to write music that's dumbed down enough for the general public to understand it. So you can't throw in like jazz riffs and time signature changes. That's why all the music that's big, it's very straightforward, almost childish. You know, like, what is this? But people are going crazy. You know, hey, Macarena, really? Really, bro? You know, have you ever heard this guy or this guy or this guy? It's strange. Um, but there's tons of work that goes into it. And, and, and that's what I was saying, like the talent, it has to be some talent plus tons of work will get you further than being uber naturally talented and being a lazy, egotistical asshole. You see the guys with the less talent but the more work ethic make it much, much farther. Same with the marketing stuff. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm not a math genius or a scientist. I just put my head down and work for years. Like I lose track of time and of everything. And it's just the work, it's the work, it's the work. It's, there's no luck. There's no like, well, he's lucky because he's from what? Because I'm from a poor family in Ada, Oklahoma. That was my luck. I mean, give me a break. It was the work. And it's, it was really inspiring. I mean, I've been playing. You notice I haven't posted a video in a while because I've been writing and playing the guitar and watching music documentaries for the last week and a half solid. I stopped watching all of the filler stuff that's on YouTube about uh, you know, news of the day or, you know, black people versus white people and Chinese people versus Mexicans and Trump versus this guy. And we're going to go to war. Oh, we're not going to war. Oh, there's a Russian investigation. Okay. It's I got sucked into all that, just like we all have. So instead of focusing there, I started focusing on, you know, things that actually matter to me, you know, like music and watching this stuff. And it's great to get to look back at all those bands who were a mystery and they were like gods to me back then and hear them tell their stories. You know, and when you hear them tell their stories, you realize, oh, there was nothing magical about this guy. He just picked up a guitar and kept playing it and he's still playing it. He's been playing it for 60 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? At this point, Sammy Hagar is 70 years old. He still can sing his ass off. He's still playing music. He's still got a band. And another thing about Sammy was he was smart with his money. This is one other takeaway I took. We all know, especially when you live in Hollywood, you see the guys from the bands that were big at this point like 30 years ago. And you see them in the AA meetings. They're not, they don't look good. They don't have a lot of money. The mansions are gone. The limousines are gone. The money's gone. They blew through it thinking they were going to be Led Zeppelin and just be big forever. But, you know, especially when you're in a, caught up in a fad like trickster, like they just kind of caught the tail end of a fad, like, hey, we'll just glam it up. And, and then it was over. And then they were done because they didn't have an identity outside of glam rock. So when glam rock was, was a joke, it, was, it wasn't cool anymore. They had nowhere to go. You know, a band like Motley Crue survived because they had their own, they were slightly outside of the genre. They kind of kicked it off and people just copied them. Some bands were able to creep through and make it. But, um, and Sammy's one of them. He's still got a band. He's still playing. You know, he, he admits it in the book. He's like, when I make an album, maybe it'll sell nine, ten thousand 10,000 albums. But luckily, he doesn't care anymore because he's worth about $120 million, according to the internet, according to Google. And that's because while everyone was drinking, buying cars, setting them on fire, getting divorced, losing half their net worth each time, burning down houses, blowing money on excessive private jets and stage, you know, just all this stuff. A lot of bands that were big at that time, they don't have any money anymore because they blew through it. But Sammy had some guy working with him, a business manager, and Sammy came up with a lot of ideas. He saw a lot of things before they happened. The dude 
had a fire sprinkler company because he was building a home and they told him that they had to put in fire hydrants and it was going to cost a bunch of money and they were going to have to wait. He said, no, I put in fire sprinklers. We don't have to do that. If you let me put in fire sprinklers, I'll show you. We don't, we don't need the fire hydrants. And they let him do a test on one of his houses. He was buying homes for, for rental properties way back in the day. When he would get money, he'd put it into other things. And they, uh, they, the fire department allowed him to do a test. He took one of his junkier homes, fit it with fire sprinklers, put a trash can in there, lit it on fire, and then had a neighbor call the police or call the fire department when he saw the smoke. And they did, a, they did the math to see if the fire department got there first or if the sprinklers got there first. And of course, right when the smoke hit, the sprinklers stopped the fire. And by the time the fire department got there, the fire was over. So they said, okay, you can do that. And his light bulb went off. He said, I'm going to start a fire sprinkler company. And they started installing them all over the, the state where he lived. And it was a successful business. Another idea was he was spending a lot of money on traveling for his band. Uh, you know, and, and he was sick of paying travel agents, like $100,000 a year were going to travel agency fees back then. There was no internet. There was no Expedia. So instead of paying that, he said, I'm just going to start my own travel. He bought a travel agency, and they booked his travel. So now he wasn't making any money on the agency, but it was saving him all the fees that he normally paid to someone else. He just paid them to himself. Then he started booking other bands. Like he went to all the labels that he knew and said, I've got a travel agency, and he started booking tours I mean, booking travel for all the big celebrities back then. And he just did this over and over. He had a mountain bike company before there were mountain bikes. He bought a, uh, some land in Mexico in Cabo and built a place called Cabo Wabo and uh, built a tequila line called Cabo Wabo Tequila, I think was the name of it, which he ended up selling for like $100 million later. And he still has the Cabo Wabo Cantina, and it's printing cash, making millions. I mean, he was just a smart guy. It's good to see someone come out of that era, and they're not broke, destitute, and regretful, and still trying to tour in little clubs to get by. Like, you see the bands now that used to play stadiums, and they're playing little clubs for maybe, you know what, a couple grand a night to pay the bills. It's, it's good to see someone on top, end up on top. And they all ended up on top. I mean, everyone in Van Halen is still massive net worths. But dude, I'm telling you, it's a really good book, even especially if you were into that kind of music back then. But even if you're not, it'd probably be a hard read because you won't be interested enough to stick with it. But there are some interesting life lessons in there. He, he saw psychics. He believed in the psychics. He let the universe be his guide. When he had a dream about something, it would come true. Like he really was on this weird path with the universe that reminds me of some things that have happened to me. But that was another cool aspect and a cool angle of it. Uh, but it was a great read, man. Like I said, if you're a fan, check it out. If not, you might want to check it out. It's got some cool stories in there. Um, but it's mainly going to it's gonna blow your mind if you're around my age and you were at least alive in 1985, 86, 87, 88. And you remember, you know, how do I know when it's love? Hot summer nights. Pound cake. Oh, my God. They had to finish what you started. They had so many songs, man, from that Van Halen era. Interesting story, interesting tale, and I just thought I'd share it with you. So that's it. I hope you're having a great week. Um, thanks for tuning in. We got the retro morning coffee with Malin Daris coffee cup. Boom. From my man Rainmaker, I believe. Anyway, me and my Chili Peppers t-shirt are going to do some things, go to the gym, do some work, drink some coffee. And that's it. As always, have a great day. Leave a comment to let me know you're here and what you think of the post, the video, I mean. And that's it. Have a great day. I will see you in the future.